And I often have to reassure supervisees, we're not going backwards. This is progress. This is progress because we've unburdened the system a little bit more. We, we've helped some of the parts relax a bit, so now they can take in more resources. I want to welcome our guest today, Annabelle McGoldrick. Welcome back to the Art and Science of EMDR. And thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. You, you're just on fire at the moment, Rotem. You've just got so much going on. Do you ever get time to sleep? Uh, very, very little. But every once in a while, you know, I have coffee. And Also, there's a couple of faces I recognize. David, I've had a chat with David and Irene in the UK has just said hello to me as well. And there's people in Canada. Are there any Australians here? Uh, I think it's a uh, very, very early in the morning in I Australia right now. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's, uh, there's Brits, Brits, Americans. Oh, someone from, Phyllis from Israel. Hi, Phyllis. Oh, greetings from, from Brazil. Brazil. Oh, that's exciting. Friend. Yeah, that's really exciting. Well, I'm actually in the UK today. I'm usually in Australia. But that's that's kind of what gives me a bit of a global fascination. I like to know where everybody is. It kind of helps settle my parts to know where on the planet you're all waving in from. Because I just think that's what's so gorgeous about working online these days is that we can create a community online across the globe and I can speak and you can hear me at the same time. So that's just that's just re oh, it's all from Miami. Hi. So that's really lovely. And um, yes, so we're, yes. we're doing an IFS informed course. It's just kind of an introduction to how to integrate IFS as an approach into EMDR. So it's saying we're still doing EMDR, but how is interweaves and preparation can IFS really help us? Because IFS, I mean, what's slightly challenging for my parts is IFS is a whole therapy in itself. I know David's looking at me at the moment and David's done part, part one of IFS. So I liked what Anna Gomez said once where she said, my therapy home is EMDR, but I've got lots of lots of fancy furniture from different therapies. And I'm kind of building an extension at the back to a whole extension of IFS. And it's how I can kind of build a corridor between my home of EMDR and my extension at the back into IFS therapy. And Great. So of there's so much talk in the EMDR learning community about the integration of parts work and EMDR and IFS and EMDR. So can we start by talking about maybe the main differences between Hearts work in general in IFS? Um, the main differences, I mean, I'm not that au fait with all the other ego state models because there are rather a lot. I, I do touch on it briefly on the course. You've thrown me a question there. I wasn't expected, Rotem. So you see, give my memory banks a moment to catch up. Um, one of the biggest differences right. is my understanding between the views of structural dissociation and internal family systems therapy, because a quote I've got from structural dissociation is the idea that the parts are holding stories and narratives and unmet needs. Now, IFS doesn't see parts in that way. In that IFS way. as sacred inner beings. IFS says the parts are burdened with their stories, their belief systems, their unmet needs. So in IFS, they're not trying to get rid of the parts. They're, they're trying to welcome the parts in as well, really essential to the system. So I guess it's this 
philosophical difference about multiplicity, whether you see someone as being a mono mind that's just got a little bit split because of trauma, or whether you see the parts which IFS does as each having different distinct jobs, jobs to help um, be managers and plan things, jobs to help protect by being a little bit more reactive, and exiles who were seen as the kind of younger parts holding a lot of the burdens. But the protectors are burdened too. So very much the message in IFS is it's not the parts that are the problem, it's the burdens. The burdens are the problem because it's the burdens that kind of create the really extreme roles. The burdens kind of, one metaphor in IFS, it's a little bit like a ship in a storm if there's several people on a ship in a storm, then they have to take quite extreme positions to balance that ship. So if the trauma is is the storm, when the trauma stops, then the parts are kind of stuck in those polarised positions. One's maybe drinking, one's maybe being very critical. And they're kind of frozen in those roles from, say, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So... Um, one of the main things is that IFS is coming from a place of kind of love and appreciation and welcome and compassion for the parts, regardless of their behavior. So often that's what's lovely in the dialogues with the parts. Often the parts themselves don't want to be doing those behaviors, but nobody's ever asked them. Nobody's ever got to know them. So my simple understanding is that conception that it's not the parts that are the problem in IFS, it's the burdens. But I can't refer to all ego state models. I know another one I worked with a lot, the codependency model, Peer Melody's model, does have a lot of overlap with IFS. Um, so I guess it also depends about the user's hands as well, how the individual is, is using that ego state model. But yeah. certainly my narrow understanding of structural dissociation is the idea that not necessarily treating the parts as as people and separate individuals but more as story holders story keepers whereas ifs is very much their sacred inner beings treat the parts as people and that's what brings about the change is really listening to them appreciating them and helping them on burden. Sorry, a long answer there. Yeah, I like long answers. And I also like the way you say trauma. Um, we, um, I, I tell it to trauma. Mark Brain as well, trauma uh, <laughs> with a British accent. I love that. And so you talked about the burden. And I think that one of the key concepts in IFS is the self, right? The self with capital S that not necessarily emphasized in other parts, parts models, how does that fit into the model of EMDR? Well, that's a really great question, Rosham. I mean, it's something I keep scratching my head myself. I guess that's what really unites both therapies is the idea that the healing energy is within the client. In EMDR, we see it as the adaptive information processing model. In IFS, it's the self-energy. And you've just reminded me, I've got a part who said that, oh, Annabelle, you didn't mention the self when you talked about the parts. Because <laughs> that, that also is the most important aspect of IFS, is that the self is seen as not burdened by the trauma. It's the parts that, the parts are, have taken the hit, basically, to protect the self. So that's another aspect of IFS I really love is this incredibly optimistic message that you don't need to have had a secure attachment and loving parents. That self energy, your essence, your soul, your beingness is there and that's never damaged by the trauma. It's the parts carry the burden to protect the self. Now, that's a lovely theory, but some clients we meet get very kind of phobic of that self-energy, very kind of afraid of it. So that's something that can take quite a bit of work from an IFS point of view. But I guess I feel that's what 
is more helpful for me as an EMDR therapist. IFS gives me more of a definition of what that healing energy looks like, what it feels like, because IFS defines it a bit more. I mean, I know there are eight C's. Let's see if I can remember them. Compassion and calmness and creativity and clarity and connectedness and confidence and courage and also the five P's, the patience, the presence, the perseverance, the playfulness. I'm sure I've forgotten something there and someone can tell me in a moment, but it kind of as an EMDR therapist, it gives me a bit more of a map of what that healing energy is. Whereas I don't feel I get enough of a map in EMDR with the adaptive information processing model. I mean, that's more a concept perhaps, more theoretical construct it's certainly similar to the idea that well if I break my finger then it will heal itself but actually I did break that finger I don't know if anybody can see how wonky it is and it wouldn't have healed on its own until I had a lovely doctor pin it back together so I guess I see myself a bit like that as an EMDR therapist I'm kind of like the doctor and the dentist, I'm pinning bones back together so that healing, that natural healing can occur within the client. So that's what I like that IFS brings me is much more kind of clarity about what's going on inside a client. What kind of part are they in? Are they in a protector that's dissociating, blocking, distracting, avoiding that I could help the client get to know and befriend and help that part become more of an ally. Or I know what I've heard from a couple of my EMDR colleagues is that they've heard colleagues complain about clients. Oh, that client can't do EMDR. They're really borderline. They're always, they're always dissociating. They're always distracted. So it kind of invites us as therapists to be critical of our clients not being able to do it. Whereas if I come from IFS, it's constantly reminded me, well, what part am I in? What part of me is judging my client? What part of me is not welcoming that protector in the client to get curious about that part and get to understand how it got to take that extreme position to help the client survive. So it just, yeah, it just gives me much more of a map for the same healing process in both therapies. I mean, I, that's what I love that really ignites them. To me, they're both, they both, patience. Thank you, David. That was the one. That's the one I forgot. Thank you. Where am I and where is my client? So IFS just gives me much more of a map to follow on what's going on because our inner world is so complicated. Yeah, I was going to just say memory reconsolidation. That's what I love about both therapies as well, is they're both trying to activate memory networks and then link them up with good stuff and essentially change the way we store our memory so both therapies are trying to do the same it's just my experience is that IFS gives me much more of a map to follow a guide on what's happening in my parts and my clients parts that can be blocking that flow of the adaptive information processing and where we are in the healing journey yeah, so I want to hear more about the therapist parts. I think that's a, a really important part that you teach in the training. But one of the other things that I think are important and helpful is that you talk about the difference in the language and in the thinking of the therapist, right? So IFS originates from systems theory. Things are more complex. You know, it's not linear. It's not A leads to B you know, understanding how the brain works, this is how things are in our work with our clients. It's not A leads to B. Well, sometimes it is, but most times it's not. And in IFS, it really, it gives us a wider theoretical framework. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that a little, and then I want to hear more about the therapist parts and how does that help us to do a better job with our clients? 
Oh, yes. I mean, the systems theory approach is so important. I mean, I've been lucky and worked as a family therapist and it's kind of how a family system balances itself. I mean, I worked in an addiction treatment centre and I used to use the metaphor that the family was like a child's mobile, a baby's mobile hanging over the cot. And I'm shaking my hand because when the wind blows, the whole family moves. So it's the impact addiction trauma has on a whole family system and the kind of extreme roles so you'll normally find somebody in the family who's really hard working and really striving and really good and then somebody who starts to behave like a scapegoat and acts out and in some ways I think the person who's the scapegoat and acted out and turned into drugs or alcohol is often the healthier one because they're showing the dysfunction within the family. They're not kind of pretending it's not there and covering it up. So that idea of a, of a system in a family and everyone affects everyone else, if we believe that we have parts, and if you read Robert Falcon and Richard Schwartz's book, One Mind, Many Parts, is the idea that culturally, we evolved to have parts so that we could become really clever and sophisticated as human beings. So we could have parts who are writer's parts and daddy parts and mummy parts and creative parts and playful parts. So it's this idea that culturally we need this kind of separation in our system. That's the argument for multiplicity and that we need those parts and uh, there's a part of me smiles because I met my husband, I told David this, 30 years ago. And I said, oh, I feel all parts of me are welcome. And I, so I kind of had an intuitive sense of the different different parts of me doing different jobs. And so that idea of a system within me, I mean, I guess it makes sense because then we can kind of relax and do something else. You might have noticed when you learn to drive that you can then kind of listen to music and chat when you're driving now. You couldn't when you started. So that's, to me, different parts are doing that. And the danger to me with EMDR is that if we don't pay attention to those parts, then parts can kind of feel pushed out. They can feel like we're kind of crashing too fast past the protectors and we've not paid attention to this really valuable job they've done. And oh my God, we've gone to this really vulnerable exile who had this horrific experience. And oh my God, that person's just been exposed. So to me, like you said, IFS just gives us much more of a sense of the whole system and an awareness of what we're crashing through. And you said, yes, that EMDR is taught in this linear do phase one, take the history and then go to preparation. Once you've done the preparation, find your target, desensitize your target. <laughs> um, but clients don't work like that. You know, clients get scared, clients want to avoid. I mean, I've got clients who we have to go. I know Jamie Marriage talks about this a lot as well as a process approach, which I think is great that more and more people are doing this. But I won't think twice about going back to preparation two or three months into into therapy because that's what the client client needs because we've kind of dived in there with some exiles too quick and the system's got a little bit a little bit freaked out so it's really okay to go back to those other steps and I often have to reassure supervisees we're not going backwards this is progress this is progress because we've unburdened the system a little bit more, we've helped some of the parts relax a bit. So now they can take in more resources because it isn't a linear process. So they can adjust a bit more to the present. So I think that idea of seeing it as, as a whole system, because that's the idea of parts as well. It's not to get rid of them, but to help them to cooperate, collaborate and work together much better so that little exiles become much more playful firefighters become much more kind of energetic and you know i, I love my firefighters because they always remind me i need to book fun things to do 
Is that answering your question, Rotem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what you just said about loving your firefighters and getting to know your own parts. That's, I think, it, this is an important part of, you know, I always tell consultees that the best way to learn EMDR is not through training, is through your own EMDR therapy, right? Like, it's good to do trainings. Most trainings keep things theoretical and when you do your own work, you really get the sense of how it really works. I'm wondering if you can talk or maybe give some examples with, you know, with trainees that you've done before uh, and some of your trainees or how it helps or what are the benefits of doing your own parts work as part of the training? Well, it is one of my advantages, I guess, that I originally trained as a psychotherapist rather than a psychologist, because it meant I had to do about 150 hours of my own therapy to become a therapist. I do really love working with therapists because I say, you know, I'm not just helping you heal, I'm helping your clients heal as well, because you're absolutely right. The best way to learn EMDR is to experience it yourself as a client. It's funny, I had a new client yesterday and he said, oh, I'm a bit worried that I'm going to be watching all the time what you're doing as a therapist. I said, but that's brilliant. That's what you're here for. And I'm sure you can do several things at the same time. And if your therapist part, who's just observing too much, gets in the way, then maybe we need to have a chat with him and help him relax a little bit. But, you know, our therapist parts are really important as as carers, I mean, I know when I first started as a therapist before EMDR, I loved it because I had this sense that the best parts of me showed up. So I think that was my experience of my own. I didn't have the language of self-energy, but I think it was my own self-energy showed up in service of my clients and it was easy to access it. And if you get to experience your own therapy, your own EMDR, then you get to experience that for yourself, that healing energy within yourself. And I also think you can't take your clients where you haven't been yourself. So I think that's really important to kind of know where your clients are. I mean, I've had a few people recently, well, probably four people recently, who've had what they describe as bad EMDR therapy. And... You know, one of them had, I was talking about going too fast to the exile, to a really traumatized little part. I mean, this is a lady who had horrendous sexual abuse when she was a child. And her first EMDR therapist did the linear history taking, preparation, assessment, went to the target and just kept telling her to relax. Just relax. Go with that. Just relax. Go with that. What did she do? She never went back. She never went back because she didn't feel safe in her own inner world. So when we started work, I didn't spend that much time, but just actually spending a bit, explaining to her about parts, first of all, and why she had parts shouting at her, that she was disgusting, shouting at her to kill herself, shouting at really horrible things. And the way I went, Oh, well, they're just your protectors. You know, they're her extreme parts in a storm trying to help a little girl survive a horror and not tell a soul about it. How else do you survive that? So welcoming those parts in at the beginning, getting to know what they wanted for her, that they wanted her just to be safe, but they also wanted her to keep quiet. They didn't want her to talk. And then actually in the first processing session, we did actually just at the end get permission to go to the little exile and just to get her out, just to bring her to now and to bring her some compassion and an update that it was over. And she just felt like this incredible weight was lifted. <laughs> and um, she kind of looked, she kind of, I think she actually said, oh my God, this is miraculous. This is the first time I felt some relief. And she came back the next week and she said, well, Annabelle, that lasted for about a day. And then I got triggered by my partner again. And I said, well, I'm not surprised because, you know, you've been sitting with this for about 50 years. So I wouldn't have imagined it would go in one session. Um, but I said, 
I'm really curious, what was it, what was it I did differently to what the other EMDR therapist had done? And she kind of sat and sat for a moment and she said, you were like a guide to my inner world. You knew exactly where I was and what was happening to me. And you helped make my inner world safe. And that to me is the difference of getting to know the parts and knowing why they're there and knowing why they're saying and doing quite hurtful, unpleasant things, but just to kind of appreciate them and welcome them and help them relax back a little bit. And that's really, you know, it's really helped inform me on, well, what a difference it makes when we're IFS informed with our EMDR, where we're then able to be a guide to a client's inner world. That can be very, very scary when you've got critical part shouting at you, horrible things that you're disgusting and you need to die. Unfortunately, yeah, I'm familiar with the people needing EMDR to, you know, correct their previous EMDR experience. That happens. And uh, I think another thing about IFS that I appreciate is that all parts, their intention is good in terms of the system, right? Some way that sometimes seems weird or not aligned with linear thinking, the parts want the best for the individual, right? For the, the client. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the difference. If you come with that appreciation of them, you help the client make that appreciation Instead of saying, oh, I'm sick of that part. I wish it would shut up and go away. If you're saying, well, let's just get to know that part. Let's get to know what its intention is, what it is it wants for you. Not its behavior, but it's it's a little bit like parenting. Um, we're, we're parenting our own parts. Once that part's appreciated, then it can soften. Then there's a relationship being built. So it's very much about relationship building that makes a big difference that allows the part because often protect like I said a moment ago protectors often go oh but I actually don't like doing this job and I'm tired doing this job and I really would like to do something else but nobody's ever asked me before nobody's ever listened to me nobody's ever appreciated what I'm really trying to do so I think it's these concepts that we're feeding into EMDR that EMDR kind of just is a little bit too basic in how it's taught. It kind of suggests if we follow the rules that all of this will happen and it doesn't. I mean, the most important thing to me is what we're doing here is encouraging people to constantly extend their learning, to constantly expand. My favorite saying is, Live as if today is your last. That's make the most of every moment. Learn as if you'll live forever. And it's that kind of hung, hunger for learning. That's what you're trying to facilitate within your community. That I, I think some in the EMDR community kind of forget a little bit and get a little bit lost on the structure. Are you doing this standard protocol properly? And, you know, that's what we talked about last time, why, you know, only 10 to 12 percent of those who train in EMDR actually go on to become practitioners. I mean, what are we doing to put them off? To me, learning is all about lighting a fire within people. That's a passion for football learning. <laughs> As one of my supervisees in group supervision said this morning, she said, well, what I realize, Annabelle, is the more I learn, the more I know I don't know. <laughs> right. That's so true. I think this is what we're doing here, right? In the MDR yeah. learning community in general, we keep learning. And I agree that MDR at the beginning seems rigid. So I have some colleagues who, you know, did the training and, you know, I told them you have to do the training and they did the training and now they don't practice it because it seems um, too rigid. And I think that the language of, the, of IFS really brings some flexibility into the India work that we're doing with our clients. Yeah. So it brings this real relationship building idea, 
which I think is kind of implicit. I know I really enjoyed Mark Dworkin's book, EMDR, The Relational Imperative, and he says wonderful things in there. And he says the relationship is left more as kind of in the background for you to learn the basics first. But like you said, we kind of lose people in the training and they kind of miss that bit. And it's how could we continue to expand that for them and help them make it a much more relational therapy? Because that's my experience of it is once we're actually processing really big, deep experiences with clients, it's the most connected I've ever felt with anybody. Because it's like they've let me into this inner sanctum, their secret inner world. And I kind of feel so honored and there's something so precious and so magical happening. But it's kind of what can we do better as therapists to create that safety, create that trust. And it's not by following a list. It's not by following a piece of paper and making sure that my NC matches my PC. Um, yeah, we need to be flexible with our clients. So Annabelle, I see that we have some questions in the chat and I want to leave some time for Q&A. But before that, I want to say a few words about your training. I'll talk about process. You talk about content. So Annabelle and I have been talking in the last few months about how to do that. Annabelle has been teaching IFS informed EMDR over 16 weeks and it's three hours every week in Australia. And I told her that it might not fit to people's schedules here in the United States and in, in Europe. So after going back and forth and really thinking about how to do it in an effective way, we created a course that is, first of all, a cohort-based course. So you will have seven weeks. And in these seven weeks, people will have a chance to watch some of the videos on their own and then interact with other members. And then once a week, meet with Annabelle for questions and Q&As and fine-tuning these skills and do a little practice. Again, what we talked about earlier to get to know your own parts. And this has been my vision for a long time that trainings will be, first of all, you don't have to take days off to do this course. You have to watch videos on your own time and meet one hour a week over seven weeks. And then you learn how to fine tune these skills. You learn, you come back, you try things. We started already with attachment informed DMDR and people are trying things and they come back and they post questions and Mark is answering their questions. And then we're doing a little demo in the training. So it's not your traditional training that you are kind of, you know, do a two or three day training and then you're on your own you have a chance to really practice, try what you learn with your clients and come back with questions and do more practice. The cost of the training is $397, but for the next 48 hours, we have a early bird special and it's only going to be $297. And that is going to be only for the next 48 hours. So with that said, Annabelle, do you want to talk a little bit about the content of the training? What is being taught in the training? Well, I mean, I'm just trying to kind of fit in bits of IFS that can be really useful, ways to identify parts, kind of help you understand the difference between the firefighters, the managers, the exiles, and self-energy, and how we can facilitate more self-energy within ourselves and within our clients. And, you know, D David's here and he's already done 100 hours on an IFS part one. So it is saying we are just kind of dipping our toe into some of the most useful and elegant aspects of IFS. Because as Rotem has been saying, it's this lovely kind of soft, gentle, appreciative inquiry approach with parts that kind of helps the whole client system kind of oh, kind of settle a little bit and feel more welcomed, more seen, more appreciated. And 
you know, the first bit is is kind of identifying parts and helping clients notice parts in their own system, in your own system, and parts kind of show up as sensations and thoughts and memories and how to just kind of welcome them. And one of the key aspects of IFS is this concept of unblending. That's what Richard Schwartz says was kind of the magic way to um, access that self energy, that essence, that beingness of us that's never damaged by trauma. And blending is the idea of just helping our parts, just relax back a little bit, give us some space to make more space for self energy. Now, it sounds wonderfully simple, but there's a million and one different ways to do it. And it's how to kind of find your own way with that. And and that that's where we're starting is all those lovely befriending questions. Because the other bit I was saying earlier, this idea that parts are kind of frozen in time in roles they took on, like my client in the sexual abuse case, roles her suicidal parts and self-hating parts and disgust parts took on to help her survive and not talk about it. How can we help them get an update? How can they kind of look at her today as a professional woman, a mother of adult children and kind of go, oh, the world's safe today. I don't need to take these extreme roles anymore. Oh, I can. I can. So that kind of U-turn, that update, that unblending is a really kind of central part of IFS. And it's such a handy, it is what we're trying to, help the adaptive information processing model do in IFS but to me we kind of leave too much to chance in EMDR. IFS gives us much clearer tools and clearer questions, clearer questions that just become brilliant interweaves in EMDR to kind of as I said A know where our client is in a world and B help them well kind of get unstuck from being there and befriend and appreciate and get an update into the present and kind of feel the client's loving, compassionate, curious, patient energy today. So I just think it just skills us up much more as an EMDR therapist. One of my team really got it in the first course, first 16 week course she did. And she was kind of like a kid in a sweet shop the whole time. And she kind of went, oh, oh. I've got it, Annabelle. It's like with EMDR, it was like going into a darkened room, not knowing where the client was. But now, now we're turning the lights on. Now we're turning the lights on when we know who's there. We know who's there in that room. Is it little scared children? Is it happy children? Is it critical children? So that's what it's giving us. We're not reinventing EMDR. We're just kind of making it a lot more... Well, a lot clearer. It's this idea. This idea. My parts really love maps. They love having maps to follow, and IFS gives us a clearer map on what some of the stages could be in those eight phases of EMDR, and a clearer map of who some of the parts are inside the client. So it just kind of equips us a lot better to, well, be more be more confident and. I, you keep referring to therapist parts. That's so important because if I don't know what part I'm in, you know, I might be going, oh, God, is this bloody client again? I wish they'd bloody hurry up and <laughs> why are we still going? But, and, uh, you know, if I listen, it's like, oh, I mean, this is the tip I want you to take away. If I listen to my bored parts, my irritated parts, I always, first of all, just write it down. I'm bored. I'm irritated. Now, is that mine or is that the client's? Is that some unconscious material? Again, in my lovely supervision group this morning, one of my clients said, she said, oh, I'm feeling, not client supervisee, she said, oh, I'm feeling a lot of despair as we talk about this client. And she said, I don't think that's mine. I don't think that's my despair. And it's those unconscious communications from our clients about where they are. And we might have a client that's really critical with us, like, come on, come on, come on, hurry up, hurry up, do this EMDR thing. Why are we not doing processing? Why are you doing more resourcing? I'm sure you've met those. And 
it's how can I kind of make sense of what part the client is in and help them unblend from that part. But I have to unblend from my parts too. I have to welcome my impatient, my bored, my irritated parts. And for me, it works to write down what part I'm in and then they can either relax back or I can take it to supervision or I can, I mean, usually I'll journal, if I've had a tricky session, I'll usually journal about it in my reflection time afterwards and then take it to supervision, then take it to therapy. So I'm still having my own therapy. That's important. Yeah, important for all of us. And again, if people are taking this training with you, the course, it's over seven weeks, they will have a weekly meeting with you. So if they're trying something, yeah. They're not sure, can always explore it with you. Okay, so this is the time that we're switching over to the Q&A. So before we do that, and I'm going to ask people in just a minute to turn their videos on and, and say hello, I want to thank you, Annabelle McGoldrick, for being our guest today and teaching about IFS Inform the MDR. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.